I want to talk about this idea of consensus reality because at a time where massive decisions have to be made, we are at a point, at least in the United States specifically, I don't want to extend this too far out beyond that. I'm sure other nations and other peoples are having similar issues in their own way, but in the U.S. specifically, we are at a point where our collective understanding of what even knowledge is, of what <laughs> medical science is, of what climate science, you know, all of these inner, these these issues that are that are scientifically factually based, and yet people are at this we're at this critical point where we cannot even agree on what's real anymore. Mm. Like we're really at that point where a significant portion of the American population is just doesn't even believe that <laughs> Joe Biden won in an election or that the coronavirus is a real problem that we need to seriously consider and address mm -hmm. that climate change is a real thing that is human caused. Like all of these things that are happening and we saw what happened on January 6th, we saw like we had a little window into that world and how paranoid and frightened people really are, um, whether that's legitimate or not. And I, I just see this all situated within an intersecting crisis of all of the things we were discussing about the energy systems and the massive problems that we have that need to be addressed in some form or another, and just our inability to <laughs> politically or socially address these issues. I just want to get your thoughts on, on, on how you've observed, you know, 2020, um, you know, uh, whether or not based on what we're seeing politically and socially in this country, uh, whether we truly can uh, address these issues in, in any meaningful <laughs> or coherent way at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, that's a toughie. Um, I know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this is, it's, it's a huge problem because uh, our, our information sources have become fragmented and they're in turn, they're fragmenting us. Um, you know, everybody knows mm -hmm. about the, you know, the, the algorithms and Facebook and, and other social media that feed sure. you more information along the lines you're already interested in and, and radicalize your point of view <clears throat> even further. And, uh, and so we, we end up in, we end up being increasingly tribalized instead of everybody watching the CBS evening news <clears throat> and Walter Cronkite, you know, every night and getting the same set of facts and then, you know, framing those facts a little bit more conservatively or a little more liberally. Now we just have competing sets of facts coming at us from dozens of unique uh, news sources that, you know, some of them are reliable, some of them are mainstream, some of them are completely off the wall and who's to, who's to assess, you know, where the, where the truth is. So it's, <clears throat> it's causing us to become more tribal. Mm -hmm. And at a moment in history, when our systems, the, the support systems of civilization are starting to give way, we talked about the energy support systems, there's also the financial support system, there's, uh, you know, all these um, <clears throat> political and, and other systems that all have to be working and all working together in order to support this incredibly complex uh, society that we've built up over the last few decades. So those systems are coming under stress from climate change, from uh, resource depletion, from over-reliance on debt. All these, all these factors are kind of converging at the same time. And it's sort of the same thing that's happened to previous civilizations. You know, civilizations have this tendency to go through cycles where they build up toward higher and higher complexity. Then they reach a maximum state of complexity. And then they, you know, they hit the wall and they start to fall apart. This has happened again and again and again yeah. throughout history, going all the way back to the beginning of civilization itself. So we're in one of those cycles it's not that we've built a civilization that's immune to, you know, the, the cyclical processes of, of complexity and decomplexity that other civilizations have experienced. We're, we're in one of those cycles and we're reaching the, 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 we've reached the top of the, of the mountain and we're starting to come down 
And the, the natural mm -hmm. reflex, reflex uh, when you're in a period of societal collapse is to retreat into your tribe. And this is what typically happens, you know, historically speaking, with the with the crash of of empires and civilizations. And we're starting to see it here too. Can we stop that? Can we keep a unified um, <clears throat> view of reality that that somehow enables us to form a consensus to deal with climate change and all of these problems and and make it down the mountain without, you know, crashing apart into, you know, tribes and tribelets that are at each other's throats over the, as I think I said earlier, the, <clears throat> the crumbs of industrial civilization, crumbs and leftovers. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I would like to think that it is. And um, that's why I've, you know, made it my life's work to try and call it the way I see it and try and put out a, a view of what's going on that's as close to reality as, as I think can be verbalized and, you know, hopefully help other people uh, make those same recognitions. Yeah. But, you know, I'm only one person and, um, and I, and, and, and frankly, what I'm, the, the view that I'm putting forward, like we were talking about with renewable energy earlier is a, very much a minority view. So I'm not very hopeful, frankly, that we will be able to maintain a consensus reality and deal with all of these problems. Yeah. I think what's, what's likely is that we will see more fragmentation. If we want to, if, it, you know, those who really want to maintain the consensus, I think it's important to uh, reach out to folks in other on other, other tribes, you know, at least it's important for people in the social justice world and people in the environmental world to reach out and join hands and work together. Because if they don't, there's not a shadow of a chance that uh, there will be enough of an alternative consensus to stop the, you know, the kind of capitalist... Uh, uh, doomsday machine from just, you know, continuing to, to churn away at, at Earth's resources and, and, and poor people and, and all the rest until it's just all a complete mess. So we, we need, <clears throat> you know, alliances between, as I said, the, uh, the environmental folks, the climate activists, the social justice activists, the people who are into building alternatives, the the uh, the permaculturists, the the eco village folks, the people who want to build models of what society could look like, um, and, and and others. All of these folks need to be reaching out to each other and working together. The way it is right now, especially with the social justice types, there's, I think, all too often a feeling of, well, we've got to get our ideas first and foremost. And once we have, you know, our particular group's needs mm -hmm. met, then we can start talking about those other things. And I, that's that's not a good way to go. I think the Green New Deal actually is a, is a, a really smart effort to get some kind of buy-in from folks in, in these various um, s separate strands mm -hmm. of what we might call the movement, the, the green resistance movement, yeah. my friend Chuck Collins calls it. Uh, so maybe that's, that's a good rallying place, you know, if we can, the Green New Deal as it is, is, you know, it's just a gesture. It's not something that will save the world. It's not perfect. It's not even adequate. But um, it could be a rallying place for getting beyond some of the siloed, you know, sets of interests and demands that, uh, that might otherwise make us much less effectual in the long run. Mm -hmm.